You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get down, right? Get the point. Good. And now... Fendo. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Yeah, I super freaky. <laughs> hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody. You got Grammy Mary sitting here in my rocket chair. And it's a little bit on the burzy side out here in Grammy land and very much on the soggy side. I went out to try and dig potatoes earlier and yeah, I got mud. I got lots and lots and lots of mud. So gonna have to wait to do that tomorrow after I get off work and before the rain moves in because I got to get the rest of those potatoes dug but yeah I'm here on real liberty yeah you guys are like you really give a shit about that don't you (laughs) oh well I'm coming at you from real liberty media.com channel 10 also on the real liberty media or rlm spreaker channel on rlm radio dot or um, RLMRadio.xyz. Yeah, RLM Tune In Radio Station. Brain fart. <laughs> I'm out there on the interwebs and I'm infecting your mind with my brain fartitis. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, Lord. I've tried to stay away from the interwebs and the TV and all that. I'm, yeah, seeing all that stuff about Hurricane Michael, I just, I keep thinking about Harvey, you know, and. And how that crazy ass mess went on and how it stopped and regenerated and stopped and regenerated. And I kept thinking Michael's going to do the same damn thing. So I was actually on purpose not watching stuff because I really didn't want to see that go around again. But thankfully it doesn't look like from what little blurbs I have seen. It doesn't look like it's done that. But oh my lord, they just need to quit playing with the weather. Whoever they are... The hedon, hedonistic, I'll think of something for they. <laughs> I will. Give me time. It'll probably pop in my mind about 2.30 in the morning, but that's okay. Oh, well. I need to say hey to everybody. Over here on Fakie Book, don't think there's a whole heck of a lot going on, except for my dear sister Catherine over in Ireland has been sharing stuff right and left. And also Denny over here on Fake Book. Come on over to realliberty.org, sweetheart. A lot of the old WT family is over there. So come on over. It'll be like old home week. She sent me a message on Fakey Book saying, is there someplace else that we get together? So I sent her the link. So I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope she'll come on over. Over here on this effing site, freedomsnetwork.com. I see Grimner is over here sharing, letting everybody know that, yeah, I'm live and in poison. And uh, Lunori has joined over here cool and shared lots and lots and lots of different things over here which is pretty cool i'm gonna have to check that out later i also see that uh mujuter south was over here for a little bit as well as cowboy tech bob renner and fritz woodruff hi fritz woodruff (laughs) that's a fun name over here on minds everybody's sharing stuff like crazy and and this one that's right here thanks peter for sharing this all of these women with their mouths open and shitler is one of them and it's like oh god i'm gonna puke i threw up just a little bit in the back of my throat just oh hi minds how are you guys doing over here on twitter thank you barman for tweeting me out i truly do appreciate it and i yeah i haven't refreshed it in a little bit but i see that um there's one that i shared in the rlm chat or i believe i did i hope i did hope i hope i hope because you know it's a meme of when you share dozens of memes from pages that were all banned for their political message <laughs> i'm in trouble now <laughs> that would be me that would be me yeah i'm just gonna go ahead and just tee hee 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 on this one because yeah that's just funny 
Okay, let me see. Do I have, I know I've lost a few stalkers, which is okay because I've gained a few stalkers. And, you know, stalkers are just, you know, unless they're stuck on the grocery shelves, it's just a little on the creepy side, don't you know? Um, so, rascal, leave the door alone. Goofball cat. I kept hearing this through my headphones. And I was like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, it's my cat. The one that most definitely lives up to the moniker of Rascal. Because she is one. You know, it was a, it was a toss up between calling her Harley. Because she's got such a loud purr. Or Rascal. And Rascal won. And I think we should have stuck to Harley. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Okay. I'm not seeing a whole hell of a lot over here on um, Twitter. So I'm just going to... Oh, wow. Someone just cut... A coat hanger tattoo on their ankle. What? Oh. Oh, okay. Women are getting coat hanger tattoos in support of abortion rights. A little coat hanger on your ankle. Well, isn't that special, honey? You should just consider yourself lucky that your mother didn't believe the way you do. Maybe the rest of the world would have been lucky if... Don't say it. Don't say it. Okay, let's see. I've been to Fakebook. I've been to Effin. I've been to Mines. I haven't been to RealLiberty.org yet. Let's go see who's over here. I see the lovely Mary B is here as well as Grimner. And Terry was here for a while as well as Jim's Lighthouse. Java, 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 Java Doctor was over here as well as Rob Works. Lots and lots of people have been over here playing around. Oh, God, and I scrolled down. There's another picture of Shitlery. That woman just is not. Mm, she just is not. No. Oh, well. Now it's time to get to the place where you need to be if you want to give me static. If you're listening in on the Spreaker channel and you want to chat with me, sorry, darling, I got crap internet, so I can't keep that chat going as well as the Real Liberty Media one. So come on over to RLM, reallibertymedia.com. Join the chat room by thinking up a nickname and then start giving me some static. You'd be surprised how quickly or how long it will take for me to give you static back, depending on if I'm really intent on what I'm reading. Um, Sock Puppet, I see that you're doing a very piss poor job of ignoring Rob. Sorry. Rub it in. Rub it in. Rub it in. Okay. Oh, man. Rob's having ribeyes and mashed taters. That's so rude. <laughs> Oh, kidney beans and ham hock with cornbread. That sounds good, too. Um, I'm, I'm having ham steaks and eggs and pancakes when I get off work or off the radio. Yeah, same thing. Same thing, only different. I don't get paid for this. <laughs> My mother asks me that all the time, and I keep telling her, No, Mom, you don't get paid for doing the radio? No, Mom, no. Nobody would pay for this. <laughs> In any case, over here in the RLM, right up top, I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world, closely followed by Grimner, the RLM god, don't you know? And then there's the lovely Moose Girl, who's going to be joining Grimner later on this evening for the Freaker's Ball. Time to really get freaky be a super freak and all that fun stuff the lovely kate is also here i see you guys passing out all kinds of bubbly stuff oh hawaiian bud dude <laughs> art underground is also here hey art and are you starting your new show this coming sunday it's supposed to be snowing out here so i'm going to stay inside i'll get i'll hopefully get to listen you know, unless I get sidetracked, because, you know, instead of digging taters today, I did my laundry, and I knitted, and, well, knitting did what knitting usually does to me, and uh, I fell asleep. <laughs> I got a good nap. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Yes, breakfast for dinner is freaking awesome, Rob. I love it, especially considering that I have a new connection for for uh, uh, fresh 
eggs, not from the grocery store, fresh eggs. One of the gals that I work with, her mom, who I have known since like forever, now has chickens. And since my other chicken or my egg connection kind of sort of dried up, now I have another one. And yeah, ain't an 18 count of farm fresh eggs for $2. Booyah! So yeah, guess who's going to be a happy girl tonight after supper? <laughs> Oh, I'm a happy girl anyway. Back to saying, hey, I see, yeah, Art art Underground, yeah, I do believe Sunday afternoon directly following um, Hal Anthony and The Woodshed is going to be on with his talk show, so that will be awesome. Uh, Chalcedony is also here, as well as a double dip and a Chloe going on in the chat. We got a, may you be touched by the Cyborgian noodles going on as well, and looky there, D underscore C. Yes, they are, Rob. Naps are wasted on the young. <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. It's not necessarily safe to fall asleep when you got knitting needles in your hand, but they're circular needles, so it's okay. <laughs> you guys, what's what's this what's this obsession with ga me and gas? Oh, yeah, that's what fuels my rocket chair. I'm full of a lot of hot gas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right, guys. Um, okay, back to, let's see, who was I at? Oh, D underscore C. I also see Echelon is here as well as Gooberzilla. I love it when the cap lock attacks. <laughs> It's the attack of the cap lock. Da, da, da. Yeah, it got you, Grim. You got Grim fingered. <laughs> oh, hi, Goober. <laughs> I'm here as well as I be Don C. Kozu is also here. And look at there, layer eight. Meister Bra. What are you testing for, honey? I keep missing in the chat what you're testing for, but it looks like you're just not having fun. I hate tests. I just, yeah, mm. even, even P tests, because I don't know how to study for them. Poxified and Poxophone is also here, as well as Pompo Pompo Pon Sauce, and looky there, the lovely rain is also here, supposed to be getting that tomorrow night, tomorrow night, rain changing into snow, it's like magic, here we go, this early in the show, magic, fuck you, hey there, RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. I also see Rob Works who has fired up that bubbler. Booyah! It's what Rob Works does so well. Yes, no one can fire the bubbler like Rob does. I also see Rome's is here. Are you going to do the whole Darth Rome's for Halloween at least? That would be really cool. I have stutter fingers where the fingers just kind of go ta -tuh, ta -tuh, ta -tuh, ta -tuh. but yeah. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, I'm reading the chat. <laughs> Skittle, the f bombinator bot, is also here, as well as Phantom. Thank you, Phantom, once again, for doing my intro. I truly do appreciate it. I also see Apostle 1 is here, as well as Asmo 2. And Asmo 2... I feel like I should say that like I'm Glinda the Good Witch from The Wizard of Oz. And look, Toto, it's Asmo too. <laughs> Hi, Colfax 101. I also see Dakota, who I'm sure is quite burry right now, and Frumpy, who's also in Kanakistan, and it's kind of burzy up there too. Gromit is also here, as well as Java, 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 Java Doctor too. JJ's is also logged in, but I saw over on Twitter he was going to be hitting the sack here pretty quick. Um, yes, that is correct, Cyborg Noodle. It's like magic. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and to round out the crew over here in the chat is Sock Puppet. Hi, Sock. Uh, yeah, I know. It's not safe to be in my blanket fort when I've had chili or any kind. Of, and pretty much last week. <laughs> <laughs> if I wasn't having chili, I was having Mexican food. So, yeah, it was not safe to be um, in the... <clears throat> 
did did Skittle give it up? Skittle, Skittle, are you abstaining from the f bombs? Shame. Wow. Well, Cyborg Noodle stepped it up, and so did Barman. So you know somebody's taking it for the team. Okay, so where do I want to go? Speaking of taking it for the team, how about I go straight to this one? I saw it over on Twitter, and I thought, eh, what the hell? I haven't checked one of these out in a while. And um, basically, it's Alan West, and nah, 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 he, he's yeah. Okay. You know, I've listened to some of his speeches, and it's like, okay, that's cool. I can kind of sort of get that. And then I've listened to some of them and thought, step away from the fool aid, Alan. Bless your heart. I know you mean well, or I hope you mean well. But this is from the oldschoolpatriot.com. And uh, basically because I'm tired. I'm ti I'm sick and tired as Bill Cosby, who is now... Doesn't he, he not have an extended stay in the gray bar, Hilton? Bill Cosby used to say, sick and tired. That's what mothers always say. Grammys say it too. And I am sick and tired of all of this Kavanaugh shit. Just sick of it. It's like, God dang it. You know, don't be making crap up. Seriously, life sucks at times. And then there's times when it doesn't. And when you make shit up just to make it suck worse for someone else, how freaking petulant can you be? Oh, my God. Let's step out of the third grade, shall we? Please? Or, you know, if you're not that elevated yet, step away from the preschool mentality, people. My God. And, yes, it's my God because, you know, I own him. Her. It. Whatever. It's it's in me. <laughs> That's from another movie too, isn't it? In any case, uh, the false Me Too allegations in the post-Kavanaugh world. Hmm. Now it's a post-Kavanaugh world. Wow. Wow. Life has really gotten weird. So just ask yourself, as we draw to the end of the first week after the confirmation of Justice Brett Kavanaugh, how many times did you hear the names of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, Deborah Ramirez, or Julie Swetnick? Julie, change your last name, huh? That just sounds disgusting. Just to me, maybe. But... It's as if the progressive socialist left has moved on, waiting for the next time that they can use the same tactic. Why, certainly, you know, they have a shorter attention span than a nine-month-old. And if their screaming and wailing and crying doesn't work, then they take their diaper off and they throw shit everywhere. You know, it's basically the same thing. But then someone comes in and, and oh, povera, povera, baby. And then, you know, then they find something else to scream and holler and throw a fit about. It's just the way they roll. Now, apparently, as Alan... <coughs> is that right? Yeah, Alan. As Alan has stated previously, unless there are ramifications and consequences for these tactics and false allegations, this will occur again, which, yes, yes. You know, when you have a child and a child behaves poorly, you let them know what the consequences are. And then you follow through on those consequences whether it's giving them a time out putting them in their room if you believe in the SWAT on the backside uh, whatever the case may be whatever you tell them there's going to be consequences for your behavior then you better follow through on that or kids are going to think they can get away with it and I'm thinking a lot of these people are a bunch of kids that had a bunch of parents that went you know if you don't stop doing that such and such is going to happen and then it never happens so they thought well I guess I can get away with whatever I damn well please okay moving along so we shared with y'all the story of U.S. Colonel Will Riggins it's a story that should be uh, precedent in stopping the weaponization of false sexual assault claims. But we also need to end the dangerous action of politicizing sexual assault. So how interesting that this week we have a story of parents taking action against false allegations against their son, reported by Town Hall. 
Apparently, a Pennsylvania couple is suing the parents of five mean girls in a school district for how their son was treated when he was falsely accused of rape. The civil lawsuit was filed in U.S. District Court in Pittsburgh last week. Michael J. and Alicia Flood of Zelenopol, Zelenopol, Pennsylvania, claimed that their son, identified in the lawsuit only as TF, was forced to endure multiple court appearances, detention in a juvenile facility, detention at home, the loss of his liberty and other damages, until several of the girls reluctantly admitted that their accusations were false. Now, the girls admitted to fabricating the charges this past summer, and the boy was basically being tortured in school by other students and investigators, but the administration was only focused on protecting the girls who were lying. This is according to Flood's attorney, Craig Fishman. Now, once the allegations were proven false, they didn't really care one bit about the male student, and there has been absolutely no repercussions against the girls. The nightmare first began when one of the teen girls accused the boy of sexually assaulting her while he was working as a lifeguard in 2017. She did it because, as she said in a taped interview, I just don't like him. Now, the accusers identified as K.S. or and wait a minute. And in the lawsuit, and K.S. allegedly told classmates in October of 2017 that she would do anything to get the boy expelled. And that was why she claimed he sexually assaulted her at the pool. Then in March of 2018, another friend of K.S., identified only as C.S., claimed that the boy entered her home against her will and sexually assaulted her. Two additional friends, identified as E.S. and H.R., verified the story. Now, one month later, the boy was charged with yet another um, indecent assault, criminal trespass, and simple assault. And it was at that point when TF was arrested, expelled from his high school, and labeled as a threat to his community. After being forced to spend nine days in a juvenile detention center, he was placed on house arrest. But in May, three of the five girls admitted that they lied. And for some reason, Butler County District Attorney Richard Goldinger waited until August 30th to dismiss the second allegation and September 10th to close the charges on the first. Now, according to the lawsuit, the school has also failed to punish the students who made the false allegations. The accused student has had psychological trauma because of all of this, which I can understand that. And I, yeah, this is bullshit to put someone through that. And he's had to see a psychologist to deal with the physical symptoms, which are the direct result of being accused of something he did not, uh, when he did not do anything wrong. So let's ask a simple question. Is this what we want in America? Is this what the Me Too movement has become in just one year? Are we raising young women in America to believe that Allegations and accusations of sexual assault are means by which we seek to destroy men, ruin their lives, and assassinate their character. So, what if? What would you do if your daughter did something like that? Or if that happened to your son? I should hope you'd be just a skosh miffed. I know I would be. And if either one of my daughters were to pull that stunt, or if my granddaughters were to pull that stunt, oh, you can bet your sweet ass, I would come down on them like a ton of bricks. Because what that does is it belittles the actual fact that there are people out there, not just women, there's also men who are sexually assaulted. And that belittles what they go through assholes. Now, amazingly, to carry on with this, this was the strategy or strategic conspiracy to destroy the life of a young man. This cabal of young girls planned and were complicit in the promulgation of false allegation, 
And if we consider what this young man had to go through and consider the ruined military career of Colonel Will Riggins, to think there have been no charges brought against any of these young girls? So ponder this. What's the difference between what these five girls did and what Dr. Christine Blasi Ford, Deborah Ramirez, and Julie Swentnick did? The only ev or evident difference was that Ford, Ramirez, and Swetnick did not have friends who would lie for them. But we do have verified reports of an attempt by friends of Dr. Ford to convince one female friend to change her sworn statement and lie in order to support Ford. Now I have issued this warning and I will do so again. This chicanery will only go to damage the real victims of sexual assault and abuse by men, like Karen Monahan. Monahan, is that how you say that? Hmm. There can be no debate, doubt, or discussion about it. The Brett Kavanaugh episode was all about weaponizing and politicizing sexual assault. President Trump was right. The nation does owe Justice Kavanaugh an apology, at least on that front. I do hope that there are some legal consequences for Dr. Ford, Ms. Ramirez, and Ms. Swetnick. But no worries. George Soros and Tom Steyer um, would pay the educated or educated damages. Okay. Honey, educative Judicate. Whatever. Why do you use such big words, Alan West? <laughs> big words that I don't know. That I have a hard time pronouncing. Oh, well. Moving along. Yeah. Oh, and any legal fees. Yeah, those will be paid via the GoFundMe account. Because, yeah, they rain, raised some serious cha-ching in there. So... We all need to apologize to this young man in Pennsylvania and applaud his parents for taking up his cause legally. Those five girls need to face charges. Yes, they do. Filing a false police report, if nothing else. I mean, if you're going to use a system to work someone else over, then be prepared to have that system come crashing back down on your ass, too. What you put out is what you get back. That's the way it's supposed to be. And it will come back to haunt you, you little shits. Oh, and yeah, not any of this. Oh, my bad. Never mind. We're sorry. Yeah. They are not sorry for their malicious, heinous, nefarious attempt to destroy the life of a young man. Everyone that had a part in participating in his character assassination should be held accountable. I agree wholeheartedly with that. But let us take a step back. Take a deep breath. Reflect on what may be happening in America. We have taken a very important movement, the Me Too movement, and turned it into a weapon to destroy the lives of others. So unless you're stuck on stupid, you cannot believe that this is acceptable. Certainly women should not, um, just lest just as willing call everyone a racist, the real acts of racism loses relevance which yes it does you know it's like it's the cry wolf thing you cry wolf often enough and people just become numb to it and then they start ignoring it and it just becomes a part of accepted societal behavior and it is not acceptable so stop it oh adjudicate thank you adjudicative <laughs> I hate that word I hate that word okay so um, it's in that article there Grim I'll let you find it and try and <laughs> I hate that I had I mean I can I can handle a lot of them big old honker 25 and 50 dollar words but there are times when it's like holy crap my tongue just went twistered and it's it's going no nope. ain't going there can't do it let's fee buttle it which i'm pretty good at anyway so okay 
now that I have done that one, I did throw a few into my pocket earlier. And you know, I was looking at my the recommended in my pocket, which it wants me to, to update to the beta. And I don't want to do that right now, but it wouldn't let me look at the recommended unless I said, not right now. And so it was like, what the, what the? So, in any case, now that I have done the, done that cranky ass thing from Alan West, let me go to this one. You know, speaking of people that probably should have to deal with their comeuppance, there's quite a few people out there that deserve some comeuppance. Hell, I deserve some comeuppance at one point or another. And usually, I if I... Yeah, if it's not a fun one, then I go, oh, crap, this sucks. But, yeah, there are so many times that I got away with it. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when I got a spanking when I was a kid. I didn't get near as many as I probably should have. But, you know, and then there were times where I got a whooping that I didn't think I really deserved a whooping. But, uh, when you look at all of the ones that I didn't get a whooping for, yeah, it kind of sort of balanced out. So, this is from wiseyoungman2.webley.com. And they're taking a poll. Should Hillary Clinton give back the money she stole from Haitian children in 2010? Hmm. Now, Hillary Clinton is the last person who, who should be speaking about the hardships families have to endure while illegally crossing the U.S. border. One thing is clear. The Democrats don't give a damn about children. They only care about votes. So if the Clintons didn't care, they w or if they did care, they would not have bankrupted an entire nation only to steal American children's donations. Thousands of American children donated money to the Clinton Foundation through apps on their phones, and the money never reached Haiti. There's an awful lot of goods that got sent there that just kind of rotted, too. Can't just blame Shitlery, because the government over there was pretty much Shitlery, too. <laughs> Get that Shitlery, too. Part two. Oh, yeah. And... Yeah, the foundation, yeah. They lied about sending it to the families in Haiti. Do what, Graham? Oh, it's a masturbator. Wow. That's what it is. Okay. Oh. How fun. Let me, I'm going to click on that one too, Goober. But I'm going to get back to this one. So, <clears throat> so what do you think? Should Shitlery give the money back that she stole? It's probably ferreted away somewhere. Or maybe if the Democrats want to help the separated children at the U.S. border, they could use the millions of dollars in the Clinton Foundation. You think? Now, the WashingtonExaminer.com reported that former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and her family's Clinton Foundation is still blamed by many Haitians for the subpar disaster relief efforts after the 2010 earthquake there. Um, the New York Times in 2016 said, Fewer than half the jobs promised at the industrial park, built after 366 farmers were evicted from their lands, have materialized. Many millions of dollars earmarked for relief efforts have yet to be spent. Mrs. Clinton's brother, Tony Rodham, 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 stinky Rodham, has turned up in business ventures on the islands, setting off speculation about insider deals. Speculation. Now, there's all kinds of comments on the bottom of this, and there is a poll that you can take as well. Um, I... I don't know what good it would do, you know, other than, because the system, it's the system that is corrupted, period. You know, so even if you took that money from her and said you were going to send it to Haiti to uh, assist in the relief efforts, you know it's never going to make it to the people that really need it. You know it's not, because the system is fucked. It truly is. So, 
yeah, there is no way. It's not going to do a darn bit of good. Yes, yes, I think she should lose all of that Monopoly money. But where shall it go? You know, it's just going to go into other grubby little hands. We all know that. So, why are we messing with it? I don't know. Now, I want to get to... Um, I got a lot. There's a lot of things on dental, you know, tooth repair drugs and no longer doing fillings and no longer using drills and all that stuff was popping up in my recommended in my pocket. And it's like, what the hell? But, you know, I really want to get to this one. This it's a JK Rowling needs to stop messing with Harry Potter, which, yes, she does. And actually, when when those stories first came out, that was one of those things that um, I read with the grandkids. Because it really did, you know, when I was reading it to them, I was also explaining, you know, some of the morals that were coming out in moral of the story, whatever, whatever kind of thing. So it really was a good time. Um, of course, it was basically with my oldest granddaughter and number two grandchild. But because um, the youngest one was just too young to sit still <laughs> at that time. But, you know, they still, it's, it's like a... Um, it's become a little ritual for them. Before school starts every year, they will watch the Harry Potter series. They have it all on DVD, and they will start out like a week ahead of time and start watching Harry Potter's every night until school starts, which I think is kind of fun. And then they discuss the movie afterwards, and I think that's also kind of fun. So, but I do think, yeah, because when, when it came out that uh, Dumbledore was gay, it's like, what the fuck does that have to do with the storyline? Where the hell does that come in whatsoever? That was just coddling, you know, and then I keep hearing all this other crap coming out and it's like, oh, come on, just stop it. Just stop. Okay. You had your 15 minutes of fame. If you can't come up with something, you know, to at least equal the Harry Potter thing, then just step away. Shut up. In any case, this is from um, Kotaku.com and uh, Jita Jackson wrote this. I grew up reading Harry Potter, and it shaped my, shaped my life to the extent that I have a Deathly Hollows tattoo. Now, as an adult, I wish J.K. Rowling would just um, let me enjoy her books in peace. Now, it needs to be some, she needed to have someone proofread this, because she left the word let out. It's like, ow, mental stumble. So Harry Potter hit me at just the right age, namely 10, when I still had time to hope that I'd get a Hogwarts acceptance letter in the mail. And I started reading the series around the time the third book was released. And family friends brought me back an early copy from their visit to England. Now, like lots of children at the time, I was hooked on Rowling's vision of magic and her righteous hero, Harry Potter. You know, seeing the strength of this literal child's conviction was inspiring to me. He always tried to do the right thing, even if he was, at times, a bit dim. Also, just like Harry's friends, Hermione Granger, the brightest witch of her age, I also had buck teeth, bushy hair, and had an insufferable know-it-all, or was an insufferable know-it-all. I was destined to become an incorrigible Harry Potter fangirl. And I stayed a fan as an adult, too. Years later, my then boyfriend brought over a friend of his who had been training to become a tattoo artist, and I decided to take advantage of the opportunity. The relatively simple design of the Deathly Hollows, a plot point from the final books. And it seemed like an obvious choice for me. It's a vertical line encased in a triangle and a circle. It's simple enough design for someone still learning to tattoo people. And also, at that point, my love of Harry Potter had stayed with me through my 20s. And I'll probably like it forever, I thought. And, well, 
or at least be able to justify that the series had been a significant part of my life, which, yeah, I'm sure it is. But now, nearing 30, that tattoo is as much a source of embarrassment as it is a source of pride. It's not like Harry Potter is any less a part of my life or that the book suddenly got bad. I have some quibbles with Rowling's world building. So how does magic work exactly? But uh, they're the same funny readable books they always were. And the issue is that Rowling can't seem to help herself from track or tacking more details onto the books after the fact. And as far as I'm concerned, her additions have only made the series worse. For me, the trouble started with Rowling's declaration after the series was finished. Here we go. See, this is me too. Me too. That Hogwarts headmaster Dumbledore was gay. This was not an unwelcome piece of knowledge, but Rowling's method of delivery or delivering the information did puzzle me. If Dumbledore's sexuality was important to understanding him as a character, why wasn't that explicit in the books? There aren't any characters in Harry Potter series that have a same-sex partner, and Dumbledore was beloved, up until his death. He had largely seemed to be celibate, and the only hint that m he might have gotten close with anyone at all was in the final book which described his relationship with the dark wizard, um, Grindelwald. So when I read that book, Dumbledore's closeness with Grindelwald did strike me as possibly romantic, at least on Dumbledore's part. But I also knew that other readers could come away thinking that it was just a close friendship, especially since Grindelwald didn't appear to be as devoted to Dumbledore as he was to him. So if the message of Harry Potter was about tolerance and acceptance, then why not just make him gay in text? Well, since that Dumbledore reveal, Rowling has added even more details to her series retroactively. When Rowling came under fire from fans for not supporting a cultural boycott of Israel, some fans told her Harry would be disappointed with her. She wrote a twit longer explaining her stance and implied that by the end of the books, Harry would be on her side. You know, there comes a moment in the final book, though, <clears throat> excuse me, when Harry, whose naturally inclined inclination is to fight, to rush to action, to lead from the front, is forced to stop and consider the cryptic message the dead Dumbledore has left him. In this moment, Harry knows there is a powerful weapon that he could use, but ultimately opts not to. Harry cannot understand why using that weapon would be harmful, yet grudgingly he decides to act against his own instinct and according to what he believes are Dumbledore's wishes. Now, a cultural boycott of a country is hardly the same as a powerful magical weapon. And that's beside the point. Harry Potter has many allegorical elements, and Rowling is using her books to explain her point of, point of view. And in the process, though, she's also giving us Harry's supposed stance on Israel and Palestine. And because she's the author, does that mean it's canon? I don't think so. My personal opinion. This question came up when Rowling was annoyed that fans of her work kept comparing um, labor leader Jeremy Corbyn with Dumbledore, which, wow. Now, Rowling is free to dislike Corbyn, but her readers are also free to draw parallels from her book into their own lives. At least that's the logic behind the literary criticism practiced in Death of the Author. Although in this case, the author has seemingly made Harry Potter a living document, since she keeps on tweeting more additions to the text. Her insistence that Harry Potter must be read one way, her way, and her continuing to add on revisions to the text has only made me like the books less, which I have to agree with her here. Because, you know, I really enjoyed the first time I read those books, and I even enjoyed watching the movies with my grandkids. 
you know, it was cool. And there were times where we would have to pause the movie so I could give someone a cuddle and let them know it's okay. It's just a movie. It's not for real. Or to explain something to them and then get back to the movie. It was a great bonding and connecting and learning experience. And everybody sees into it or reads into it from their own perspective. So an author telling you, no, it must be read a certain way, that that gets my hackles up. It would be like a, a songwriter telling you, you have to listen to it in just this way, in just this setting. You can't listen to it any other way because that's what I intended. Really? Well, I'm not going to listen to it at all then. Thank you very little. So, to go on with this, it also reveals problems within the text that I was able to overlook, at least until Rowling kept pointing out to th uh, the extent to which her own politics are supposedly supported by her characters. So when she talks about whether or not her characters are like Corbin, who campaigns for a labor party that supports the many and not the few, I can't help but remember that while she criticizes the classism of old rich families like the Malfoys, similar prestigious families like the Potters don't get the same scrutiny. So when she waffles on whether or not to, to boycott Israel and claims that Harry would have felt the same way, well, since Harry's a part of her imagination, I guess he probably would. Um, I recall a strange portrayal of race is portrayed in her book. Both the portrayal of her fantasy races and the human races from our actual world. There's the house elves who are totally okay with their perpetual... Um, enslavement and then there's the human characters of color who are simply not given the same amount of character development as other characters in Harry Potter. Now the major characters of color like Dean Thomas, uh, Cho Chang, and Parvati uh, Patil, I bet I said that wrong, uh, rarely take the spotlight, and in Thomas's case, the official Harry Potter lore website, Pottermore, reported that Rowling had intended for him to have a bigger part in the first book, but that his backstory was cut to make way for Neville Longbottom's necessary storyline. Now, with Patil and Chang, both serve a short-term love interest for Potter and Ron Weasley, and... Um, until both heroes end up with their white girls that they eventually marry. I never even really put race into that whole thing myself, but I digress. Now, Patil and Chang's affections are portrayed as either over-emotional and draining or superficial and flighty. None of these characters get the growth or empathy that Rowling's main trio do. Well, they are the main trio, honey. And she's the author. So if you want to nitpick, but if she opens herself up for nitpicking, eh. So, as much as this writer related with Hermione growing up, I wish there was a major character that turned the tides of the Second Wizarding War that was also black like I am. Honey, you know, wish on one hand. You were not the author. I hate to tell you that. Hmm. I agreed till she started whining. Mm-hmm. Oh, well. Back to her little... Now, notably, in the play Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, Hermione is portrayed by a black actress. And the play has also sparked debate among Potter fans who think that aspects of it don't line up with the accepted canon. Oh, good God. Now, those additional elements include the questioning of Hermione's race in the books, which remain in limbo. Rowling, meanwhile, has pointed out that white skin was never, never specified. Well, no, it really wasn't. At least not for Hermione in the books. So it's perfectly conceivable that Hermione could be black, but she's also portrayed in the movies by Emma Watson, who I think did a very excellent job, by the way, um, whose sleek curls are a far cry from the bushy hair that comes out of my head. Okay, I'm sorry, honey. You can once again wish in one hand shit in the other. 
I thought Emma did an excellent job. Sorry. My opinion. It's also weird that there are no explicitly Jewish characters in the series of the books. And that makes analog or analogies to or okay, in the series of book that makes analogies to and draws on imagery of the Holocaust. Okay. Now the prison that Grindelwald built to house his opponents in which he was later jailed is called Nurmengard and that name sounds very similar to Nuremberg, okay, which is a site the Nazis, uh, Nazi rallies that later became the site of the prison for Nazi war criminals and the villainous Voldemort also preaches about the purity of blood and his intentions to wipe out wizards from mixed families. There's lessons all over in those books. Are we going to nitpick all of them? I know. It's almost done. But I just, I want to see where she's, how she, I'm going to line up with this gal. So, <clears throat> the ethos of the Death Eaters, his followers, also echoes the blood purity ethos of real life white supremacist groups, as well as Nazi Germany. Now, Rowling has said that Anthony Goldstein was Jewish in the series, which, duh, go with the last name. Although it's not mentioned in the books at all, does it have to be mentioned? That's my question. So if she can include a tutorial on how to pronounce Hermione disguised as a conversation between the heroine and her boyfriend Victor Crumb in the fourth book, you'd think that Rowling would have found a way to include one Jewish character. Honey! Okay, not too long ago in this little diatribe that you have here, you were bitching because she was telling you how to read it. Now you're telling her how to write it. What the hell? You like the books, and now you're telling her she wrote them bad. Ah, <sighs> okay. To carry on, in Fantastic Beasts 2, the next entry in the Pot uh, Harry Potter franchise, Rowling's has yet again introduced a new element to her text. <coughs> Nagini, who is Voldemort's pet snake, and... A McGruff late in the series has been revealed to be an East Asian woman that was cursed to be a snake. Now Rowling has explained that her inspiration for this came from Indonesian mythology as well as Betu, uh, Betawi, is that how you say that? Chinese and Javanese cultures. Yet the actress who plays this character is South Korean. Oh my god, we're really freaking nitpicking here. She will eventually be an evil white man's pet, and retroactively, this disturbing piece of information about Najini is now canon. So the Harry Potters feel like an ever-growing house of cards, and Rowling can't seem to help herself from adding more and more cards to the tower. And even though all I want to do is cherish my memories of reading these books as a child... I can't look away from the impending disaster. Okay, sweetheart, I do get, you know, as you close it out, I really do get that. And there are inconsistencies, but there's an, there are inconsistencies in every single book out there. There's lots of books that I read when I was in my teens and 20s that when I read them later in life, it's like, wow, why did I really enjoy these books? The memory was so much better. <laughs> You know, but then again, my perspective was a lot different then. So, and there's books that, there's some Asimov books that I would, I think probably this winter I will sit back and read or reread just simply because I loved them in my late 20s and early 30s and I want to see if I will still love them now. Same with, um, uh, L. Ron Hubbard books, or, uh, oh, cripes, uh, yeah, I could go through my whole stack downstairs. <laughs> I have a lot of books that I would really like to reread and see if maybe, I, Piers Anthony, those were always so fun, and so funny, he was so snarky and punny, you know, so you can't go back, but you can get different insights or different perspectives, and although I agree with you, 
that she needs to just quit inserting stuff, let her books stand as they stood, let people get out of them what they got out of them, you know, and just when, if someone asks her, say, well, you know, what did you get out of it? Instead of trying to mold and morph and say, well, it really should have been, well, if that's the way it really should have been in retrospect, that's a 2020 hindsight thing. I'm just, yeah. I liked Harry Potter books. I really did. But I really could care less about J.K. Rowling anymore. It's like, honey, you made your money. I know you started writing it out, or so your story says. You started writing it out on a napkin at a restaurant having coffee. It's a cool little story to tell. And yeah, you went from rags to riches. Awesome. Cool. Now quit 2020 hindsight armchair quarterback and what you did good. Move along, honey. <sighs> okay. Moving along. I had to get to that because I, yeah, the kids and I, we have a Harry Potter thing. But, yeah, I have moved on. I don't, I don't think I've even watched a Harry Potter movie in a couple years because I haven't been out seeing the kids just before school starts, basically. And that's the only time I watch them. Okay, so let's move on to something from Psychology Today. I'm getting into some weird shit today. It's just a freaky day. It's a freaky Friday, okay? And I'm getting into some freakiness here. So, lowest carb study, all politics, or excuse me, not lowest, latest low carb study, all politics, no science. So, the only evidence to be found in this research is evidence of bias. This was posted on Psychology Today, September 5th of 2018. So, recently, the journal Lancet Public Health published a study conducted by researchers at Harvard and the University of Minnesota warning people that low-carbohydrate diets can cause early death. Now, the paper entitled Dietary Carbohydrate Intake and Mortality, a Prospective Cohort Study and Meta-Analysis, has enjoyed broad media coverage and ignited passionate debate in nutrition circles around the world. So why the uproar? Well, the researchers claim that they track the diet and health of more than 15,000 people for up to 30 years. People eating diets lower in carbohydrate died sooner than people eating moderate amounts of carbohydrate. And individuals in lower carbohydrate groups seemed to live a little longer if they ate less animal protein. So their observations led them to conclude that animal-based low-carbohydrate diets, which are more prevalent in North America and European populations, should be discouraged. Oh, I wonder who helped pay for this study. <laughs> I'll give you three guesses and the first two don't count. So, given the rising popularity of low-carbohydrate diets, this is a bold recommendation with potentially far-reaching implications for public health. Many people will take the study at face value because it's a very large, decades-long, Harvard-affiliated study that passed scientific scrutiny by peer reviewers and was found worthy of publication, don't you know? Yeah, because it's from Harvard. So why bother to go beyond the headline to question its vid validity? Well, because it seems curious that low-carbohydrate diets, which make so many people healthier, should somehow simultaneously hasten their demise. Hmm. Now, a growing number of clinicians are successfully pr 
prescribing low carbohydrate diets in their practices to address obesity, type 2 diabetes, and other serious metabolic disorders. And an expanding body of scientific literature supports the safety and effectiveness of low carbohydrate diets, finding that they are at least as good, if not better, than other diets for weight loss. Remarkably, low carbohydrate diets have the power to put two, uh, put type 2 diabetes into remission and reverse signs of metabolic syndrome such as high insulin, high blood sugar, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL, and inflammation. Now, stricter versions of the low-carb diets, called the ketogenic diets, have been used for nearly a century to treat epilepsy. And I know some, um, a couple of people that are on keto diets right now and uh, are feeling much more energetic. But they've only been on them for like a month or so. And they have not, they've lost pounds, but they've lost more inches than pounds. And um, booyah, way to go. Now also, emerging science is exploring the potential for ketogenic diets to help manage other neurological disorders, such as psychiatric disorders, dementia, and even cancer, which what you take into your body is what your body, that's what your body uses to keep itself going, to remanu or to manufacture new cells, all that other fun stuff. So if you're taking in toxic food, aka fast food, or processed foods, it's going to have an effect on your body. Now, people all around the world are discovering the health benefits of low carbohydrate diets for themselves and sharing their progress with their friends, family, and others on social media. And as a full disclosure, this author says that she's she has eaten low carbohydrate diet for better than for the better part of the past decade, and I recommend it as an option to many of my patients. Okay, so if you have improved your own health, lost weight, and been able to cut back on medications by eating low-carbohydrate diet, should you worry that you're sacrificing years of life for the benefit you have seen? Well, of course not. So let's take a closer look at the study so that you can see for yourself why there is absolutely, positively, nothing to be afraid of except bad science. So, where is the evidence? Well, we have the ludicrous methods. The most important thing to understand is that this study was an epidemiological study which should not be confused with a scientific experiment. This type of study does not test diets on people. Instead, it generates guesses or hypotheses about nutrition based on surveys, excuse me, called food frequency questionnaires or FFQs. And she also has a picture here attached which is an excerpt from an FFQ that was modified for use in the study. So how well do you think you could answer questions like these? Uh, let's see, do you drink skim or low milk, eight ounce glasses, never or less than once per month, one to three times per month, once per week, two to three times per week, five to six times per week, one per day, yada, 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 yada. Uh, then they have whole milk and yogurt and ice cream and cottage cheese or ricotta cheese. Other cheeses such as American cheddar um, or whatever, margarine um, or butter. I don't ever use margarine. I haven't used margarine in years. Um so how is anyone supposed to recall what they have eaten as many as 12 months prior? Hell, <laughs> I have time remembering what I had for breakfast yesterday. It's not really that high on my hit parade as things that need to be indelibly imprinted on my brain. Now, most people can't remember what they ate three days ago. Note that I don't know or I can't remember or I gave up dairy in August are not options. So you're forced to enter a specific value. 
and some questions even require that you do math to convert the numbers of servings of fruit that you consumed seasonally into an annual average. Really? Now these inaccurate guesses become the data that form the foundation of their entire study. Foods are not weighed, measured, or recorded in any way. Yeah, wow. Talk about very... <clears throat> Wow, very loose with the term science on this one, aren't they? Now, the entire FFQ use, uh, that was used contained only 66 questions. Yet the typical modern diet contains thousands of individual ingredients. It would be nearly impossible to design a questionnaire capable of capturing that kind of complexity and even more difficult to mathematically analyze the risks and benefits of each ingredient in any meaningful way. So this methodology has been deemed fatally flawed by a number of respected scientists, including Stanford professor John um, Leon Leonidas in a uh, 2018 critique published by JAMA. Also, they have some missing data. Between 1987 and 2017, researchers met with subjects enrolled in the study a total of six times, yet the FFQ was administered only twice, at the first visit in the late 80s and at the third visit in the mid-90s. Yeah, you read that correctly. So did the researchers assume that everyone in the study continued eating exactly the same way from the mid-90s to 2017? Wow, I sure haven't. Now, popular new products and trends surely affected how some of them ate, such as Splenda and kale chips or cupcakes or whatever, and drank, such as frappuccinos and juice boxes and smoothies, so why was no effort made to evaluate intake during the final 20 plus years of the study? Even if the FFQ methods were reliable means of gathering data, the suggestion that what individuals reported eating in the mid-90s would be directly responsible for their deaths more than two decades later is kind of hard to swallow. Yeah, yeah. Because basically, every cell in your body is regenerated within a... I've heard from seven years down to two years. It just kind of depends on who you talk to. But every cell in your body is replaced. It's a cyclical thing. And what you put into it is what decides how well they are replaced. Now, to go on with this, there are other serious flaws to cover. But the two already listed above are reasons enough to discredit this study. People can debate on how to interpret the data until the low-carb cows come home. But I would argue that there is no real data in this study to begin with. And the two sets of data that are literally guesses about certain aspects of people's diets gathered on only two occasions. So do these researchers expect us to believe that they accurately represent participants' eating patterns over the course of 30 years? <laughs> Obviously they do, and most people don't look past headlines. So this is such a preposterous proposition that one could argue not only that the data are inaccurate, but that they are likely wildly so. Now, low-carb diets were not even studied. Yeah, you read that correctly, too. The lowest carbohydrate group in the study reported consuming 37% of their approximate um, 1,558 calories per day as carbohydrate. This 37% translates to a whopping 144 grams of carbohydrate per day. Nowhere else would this be considered a low-carbohydrate diet. Most low-carbohydrate practitioners recommend between 20 and 50 grams of carbohydrate per day. Truly low-carbohydrate diets were not studied. Instead, 
Researchers simply assume that diets containing even less than 37% carbohydrate would lead to even shorter lives. So on the surface of it, this may sound like it makes sense. If lowish is bad, then even lower is worse. Right? The problem is, with this reasoning, that low carbohydrates tend to have a threshold effect on metabolism. And this means that most people must drop their carbohydrate intake below a particular sweet spot in order to re-app the benefits. Now for many, lowering from 150 grams per day to 75 may not make much difference, but dropping below 25 grams per day can bring significant improvement in appetite, weight, blood sugar, and insulin levels. Therefore, even if eating 144 grams of carbs per day were dangerous, which the study does not demonstrate, eating 20 grams isn't necessarily worse and may for some be better. Now the authors imply that people who eat low car carbohydrate diets can delay their meeting their maker by replacing animal protein with plant protein. Yeah, mortality increased when carbohydrates were exchanged for animal derived fat or protein and mortality decreased when substitutions were plant based. This is rather misleading, as nobody substituted anything for anything else in this study. This was not an experiment, and these substitutions took place only in the researchers' minds. So by saying that low-carbohydrate diets are associated with greater mortality risk, and that they should therefore be discouraged, the authors are insinuating that low carbohydrate diets kill people. And if they truly believe this, they have a re responsibility to themselves as quote unquote scientists to the peer reviewers who accepted their paper for publication and to the public to explain how carbohydrate restriction endangers lives particularly given that there is now so much clinical trial evidence demonstrating that carbohydrate restriction can improve the signs and symptoms of some of the deadliest chronic diseases we face. The only attempt made by the authors to offer a plausible mechanism by which low-carb diets snuff people out is represented by this unreferenced hypothetical statement. Quote unquote, long-term effects of the low carbohydrate diet with typically low plant and increased animal protein and fat consumption have been hypothesized to stimulate inflammatory pathways, biological aging, and oxidative stress. Wow, really? You said all that all at once. That's, I'm impressed. Now by contrast, it is well documented and widely agreed that sugar, which is a carbohydrate, is a powerful promoter of inflammation oxid and oxidation. Blah, 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 blah. And she has a little link there for it. Now, curiously, the very real dangers of sugar aren't acknowledged anywhere in this paper. And that the authors ignore the scientifically undisputed virtues of sugar elimination while focusing on the purely hypothetical hazards of meat and fat strongly suggests potential bias. Potential bias. Or at least a significant blind spot. So wherever there are people, there are politics. And the world of nutrition science is no exception. There's a paradigm shift occurring in nutrition, and a changing of the guard may be on the horizon. 
For decades, nutritional epidemiologists at pre prestigious institutions like Harvard School of Public Health have occupied virtually all of the seats at the nutrition power broker's table. And most of them have used their influence to promote low-fat, low-cholesterol, high-plant diets. Their recommendations have been enshrined in the dietary guidelines of the U.S. and many other countries as gospel. Even though their arguments have rested almost entirely on data generated by FFQs such as the one highlighted above, which were originally developed by renowned Harvard nutrition researcher Dr. Walter Willett, one of the authors of this paper. Now the low-fat philosophy upon which these giants have built their reputations has been called into question in recent years by low-carbohydrate clinicians, researchers, and community members who witness the do and document examples every day of low-carbohydrate, high-fat diets improving health. Similar challenges to low-fat, plant-based principles have come from the paleo and carnivore communities which renounce heart healthy whole grains and legumes and embrace animal foods with their naturally occurring fats as the foundation of a healthy diet. Now the, this summer the BMJ Medical Journal told with or together with global reinsurance company Swiss Re hosted a groundbreaking summit in Switzerland entitled Food for Thought, The Science and Politics of Nutrition. It was intended to foster open dialogue between prominent figures within the low-fat, plant-based community and prominent figures within the low-carb, healthy-fat, meat-positive community. One of the central questions posed by the organizers was, what evidence can we trust? Ah, uh, that's uh, what I'd like to know. Now it was clear that our host, Dr. Fiona Godley of the BMJ and Dr. John Shunby of Swiss Re, highly respected authorities from science and industry, were taking epide um, epidemiology to task. What I was privileged to have witnessed over the course of those two days was nothing short of a watershed moment in nutrition history. We critics of epidemiology-based dietary guidelines, the illogical, unfounded, hopelessly complex guidelines that have been destroying our health for decades, were finally being given seats at the big kids' table. Now perhaps the authors of this new paper, including Dr. Walter Willett, who was a panelist at the Swiss conference, were hoping headlines about their research would be passively accepted by the public without scrutiny and delay and washing away of the whole grain sand castle. But escaping the epidemi illogical escapades the field of nutritional epidemiology has a dismal track record when it comes to the validity of its guesses. More than 80% of its hypotheses are later proved wrong in clinical trials and human experiments. This is why nutrition headlines are so confusing. One day eggs are bad for us, epidemiology. The next day they are perfectly fine, clinical trials. So in my opinion, this study's thinly veiled attempt to deter people from embarking on or continuing a healthy low carbohydrate diet by using smoke and mirrors method methodologies and invoking images of the Grim Reaper takes this study out of the realm of science and places it squarely in the arena of politics. These researchers did not conduct a study of low carbohydrate diets they dug up some old data from epidemiological studies of heart disease, desperately picked through the rubble looking for anything they could find that might support their dying hypothesis, and then repackaged their observations for public consumption. 
So don't be afraid of this paper tiger. There is no evidence of any kind in this study that low-carb diets, whether they include meat or not, will have you pushing up daisies any sooner than anyone else. So, <clears throat> like I say, you got to check out, number one, what questions were asked, how the data was gathered, and then how it was tabulated, how it was put together how they came to that conclusion. A lot of times, it's just a bunch of shit. So, when I tell people dietary advice, I basically let them know because this is what I've been doing. And it's been working for me so far. I'm still here. But, and you know, I just, I, I feel better when I get less sugar intake. I feel better when I eat more eggs and um, actually poultry, um, beef, eh, so, so. Don't do a whole heck of a lot of pork, but beef and poultry and eggs and some fish. I do an awful lot of tuna, tuna and salmon. But um, I do like my grains too. <laughs> I like my grains, I like my pasta. But I also like my fresh veggies. So, you know, and I'm, according to some standards, I am borderline obese. And then according to others, my BMI, what is that? Body mass index, whatever, is within the normal range. So, eh, it depends on how you tabulate the information. It really does. But... Yeah, for the most part, a lot of this is just so much shite. What is that? Oh, KD Troxel shared this over here on the Effen site, and I think I'm just going to have to go to it. Um... What is that? Okay, that's that Hillary Clinton thing. Ah, I'm past her. I'm beyond Hillary now. I got it out of my system. Okay, so Katie shared this over on freedomsnetwork.org. Um, and it is from zerohedge.com. Trump is right. The Fed is crazy. And here's 101 reasons why it should be shut down. I don't know that I need 101 reasons why. I think I can just go with, they're a bunch of lying bastards who screw everything up that they touch. Pretty much, there you go. But, this is from Michael Snyder via the American Dream blog. Donald Trump just made one of the most brilliant moves of his entire POTUS presidency by accusing the Federal Reserve of going loco. He's placing the blame for the coming stock market crash and horrific economic downturn squarely where it belongs. And he's firing up millions of true conservatives among his base at the same time. For many, many years, a lot of us have been trying to educate the American people about the deeply insidious Federal Reserve System. As Ron Paul once so astutely observed, it is actually about as federal as Federal Express. The Federal Reserve is an unelected cabal of central bankers that is running our economy into the ground. And the only way we're going to fix our long-term economic and financial problems is if we abolish it. I agree wholeheartedly. Now, for those of us that understand these things, it is a it is extremely exciting to hear POTUS Trump use language such as this. I think the Fed is making a mistake. They are so tight, I think the Fed has gone crazy. This is what the President said after walking off Air Force One at Erie, Pennsylvania. Now, and that is in reference to uh, Federal Reserve continuing to raise interest rates despite some recent market turbulence. Now, it may be one of the greatest things that Trump has ever said. 
And if Trump feels like his base is really responding to this sort of rhetoric, he may start using it as a campaign tactic. So could you imagine thousands upon thousands of supporters chanting, end the Fed? That would be cool. And doing that at Trump rallies. Well, I would just as soon have them just, yeah. <laughs> I like the sound of that, end the Fed. I like the sound of that. It would definitely be a beautiful thing. Now, without a doubt, the Federal Reserve has created the everything bubble. And when it bursts, the economic pain is going to be off the charts. Of course, the left is going to want to blame Trump. And so Blump, Trump is being very smart by pointing the finger at the Fed for aggressively raising rates at a time when the U.S. economy is already slowing down. So... Apparently, CNBC's Jim Cramer actually agrees with Trump. And he says, I agree with President Trump that the Fed needs to tighten less aggressively, even as he probably shouldn't have said that those nasty things in public because he's making it harder, not easier, for Jerome Powell to give him what he wants. When you look at the economy empirically, oh, an empire empirically right now, you start to see real problems. Yeah, there are real problems. And take the Fed completely out of the equation. That would be a good start to fixing them. Now, um, there are also other comments about that Kramer offered as examples of real problems. So sources within the auto industry, in addition to major suppliers, PPG industries and Trincio have suggested that the Mad Money host that or suggested to the Mad Money host that there is a definitive slowdown in auto sales. And I can tell you from my years of working at an auto dealership, that slowdown started years ago. And the high prices of vehicles has done nothing to curb that, pun intended. Slow, uh, vehicle sales are damn near parked. Damn near. At least just from going from my, what I observe in my area. This is a farming community. And yeah, if the farmers don't have money, they ain't going to spend it on new vehicles. And it, they aren't going to spend it on a lot of other things either. And so it's kind of a snowball effect. He also goes on to say housing is either pausing or down for the count, he said. And we know this because of what Lennar, the largest home builder in America, told us. Um, and then um, key economic building blocks, things like packing materials and plastics, are either stagnant or dropping in price, indicating a slowdown in shipping, which is a leading barometer for the state of the economy. Yeah? Yeah, people are getting tighter with their money and they're not spending so frivolously. Now, needless to say, criticizing the Fed is a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, Zapruder film comes to mind. And there's a reason why previous presidents have never dared to do so. But that's one of the things about Trumples. He simply refuses to be controlled, and he will not be intimidated by threats. And does he still have his own personal security as well as Secret Service? I remember he had done that because it's like, really? Do you think I'm going to trust him? So... We desperately need a POTUS that is willing to stand up to the leeches and call for the abolition of the Federal Reserve. For a long time, it appeared that doing something about the Fed was not on Trump's radar. But now that may be changing. So, we're going to look at these 101. Holy shit, I didn't realize it was that late. I may not get to half of the things I want to get to. Surprise, surprise. Number one, we like to think that we have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But the truth is that an unelected, unaccountable group of central planners has far more power over our economy than anyone else in our society does. Number two, the Federal Reserve is actually independent of the government. 
In fact, the Federal Reserve has argued vehemently in federal court that it is not an agency of the federal government and therefore not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. Number three, the Federal Reserve openly admits that the 12 regional Federal Reserve banks are organized much like private corporations. Number four, the regional Federal Reserve banks issue shares of stock to the member banks that own them. Number five, 100% of the shareholders on the Federal Reserve are private banks. The U.S. government owns zero shares. Number six, the Federal Reserve is not an agency of the federal government, but it has been given power to regulate our banks and financial institutions. This should not be happening. Shouldn't have happened in the first place. Number seven, according to Article One, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. Congress is the one that is supposed to have the authority to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. So why is the Federal Reserve doing it? Number eight, if you look at a U.S. dollar, it actually says Federal Reserve note at the top. In the financial world, a note is an instrument of debt. Now I know there's an awful lot of you that this is preaching to the choir, but still. Number nine, in 1963, President John F. Kennedy issued Executive Order 11110, which authorized the U.S. Treasury to issue United States notes, which were created by the U.S. government directly and not by the Federal Reserve. He was assassinated shortly thereafter. Quinky dink? I think not. Number 10. Many of the debt-free United States notes issued under President Kennedy are still in circulation today. Number 11. The Federal Reserve determines what level some of the most important interest rates in our system are going to be set at. In a free market system, the free market would determine those interest rates. Number 12, the Federal Reserve has become so powerful that it is now known as the fourth branch of the government, even though, well, it is governing us, isn't it? It is controlling. To govern is to control. Number 13, the greatest period of economic growth in U.S. history was when there was no central bank. Number 14, the Federal Reserve was designed to be a perpetual debt machine. The bankers that designed it intended to trap the U.S. government in a perpetual debt spiral from which it could never possibly escape. Since the Federal Reserve was established 100 years ago, the U.S. national debt has gotten more than 5,000 times larger. Number 15, a permanent federal income tax was established to exact the exact same year that the Federal Reserve was created. This was not a coincidence. In order to pay for all of the government debt that the Federal Reserve would create, the federal income tax was necessary. The whole idea was to transfer wealth from our pockets to the federal government and from the federal government to the bankers. It's a massive game of Monopoly. And sorry, sucker, but if you don't play by their rules, you go to jail. You do not pass go. You do not collect $200. Because they need that. Because, yeah. Number 16, the period prior to 1913, when there was no income tax, was the greatest period of economic growth in U.S. history. Number 17, today the U.S. tax code is about 13 miles long. 13 miles long. Number 18, from the time that the Federal Reserve was created until now, the U.S. dollar has lost 98% of its value. Now I can tell you, just because of I no longer have it, I lost that in the divorce, uh, <laughs> we were tearing down a house so that we um, on a piece of property so that we could put up a, a, a big garage and um, inside the walls of that house there was a newspaper from late 1930s and so I was having a good time reading this newspaper and 
grain prices were actually higher than they are today. Now that's prior to the Ag Department. You know, um, it's after the Federal Reserve, it's after income tax was initiated, but prior to the Ag Department was um, started. And um, money was worth a hell of a lot more then. Because if you got, um, I'm thinking that, that wheat was like, 434 a bushel now I don't know what it is now it's somewhere in that range but back then you know five grand would buy you a nice new car ten grand and you would have one hell of a nice house five grand now would barely touch a used car and 10 grand now shit unless you live somewhere like where i live 10 grand ain't gonna even come close to being the down payment on a house yeah it's not that things have gotten better it's that the dollar is worth less you need to put a hyphen in there it's not quite worthless yet. It's lost 98% of its value. So now you can, every time you spend a dollar, you're putting your two cents worth in. But that's about, yeah. Ah, to carry on with this, number 19, from the time that President Nixon took us off the gold standard until now, the U.S. dollar has lost 83% of its value. Number 20, during the 100 years before the Federal Reserve was created, the U.S. economy rarely had any problems with inflation. But since the Federal Reserve was established, the U.S. economy has experienced constant and never-ending inflation, the hidden tax. Your dollar is worth less. Number 21, in the century before the Federal Reserve was created, the average annual rate of inflation was about half a percent. In the century since the Federal Reserve was created, the average annual rate of inflation has been about 3.5 percent. Number 22, the Federal Reserve has stripped the middle class of trillions of dollars of wealth through the hidden tax of inflation. 23. The size of M1 has nearly doubled since 2008 thanks to the reckless money printing of the Federal Reserve. Number 24, the Federal Reserve has been starting to behave like the uh, Weimar Republic, and we all remember how that ended. Actually, there's quite a few that have no clue what the Weimar Republic is. I don't think it's even taught in schools. Number 25, the Federal Reserve has been consistently lying to us about the levels of inflation in our economy, and if the inflation rate is still calculated the same way that it was back when Jimmy Carter was president, the official rate of inflation would be somewhere about 10% today. Um... Let's see. Number 26, since the Federal Reserve was created, there have been 18 distinct recessions and depressions. 1918, 1920, 1923, 1926, 1929, 1937, 1945, 1949, 1953, 1958, 1960, 1969, 1973, 1980, 1981, 1990, 2001, 2008. Number 27, within 20 years of the creation of the Federal Reserve, the U.S. economy was plunged into the Great Depression. And that was on purpose. It was in order to be able to gain control of every... If you tank everything, then people have to sell at pennies on the dollar and they gained greater control. It's all a scheme. Number 28, the Federal Reserve created the conditions that caused the stock market crash in 29. And even Ben Bernanke admits that the response by the Fed to the crisis made the Great Depression even worse than it should have been. Number 29, the easy money policies of former Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan set the stage for the great financial crisis of 20, 2008. 
Number 30. Within the Federal Reserve, the subprime mortgage meltdown would probably never have happened without the Federal Reserve. I'm going to do two more and then I'm going to just let you guys, because yeah, this is, wow. If you can believe it, there have been 10 different economic recessions since 1950. The Federal Reserve created the dot-com bubble. The Federal Reserve created the housing bubble. And now it has created the everything bubble, which threatens to plunge us into the worst economic downturn in world history once it bursts. But once it bursts, maybe, maybe people will be forced to go to the barter system and get rid of money entirely. That would be cool. I know in this day and age, it's kind of hard to, that's going to be a rough transition, but it would be cool. Now, number 32, according to the official government report, the Federal Reserve made $16.1 trillion in secret loans to big banks during the last financial crisis. That's when our federal debt went up over $15 trillion. The following list is um, a list of the loan recipients that was taken directly from page 131 of the report. Citigroup got $2.513 trillion. Morgan Stanley got $2.041 trillion. Merrill Lynch got $1.949 trillion. Bank of America got $1.344 trillion. Barclays PLC got $868 billion. Bear Stearns got $853 trillion. Goldman Sachs got $814 trillion. Royal Bank of Scotland got $541 billion. Or not Eight hundred fourteen billion. Sorry, not trillion. Uh, Royal Bank of Scotland got five hundred forty-one billion. J.P. Chase, three hundred ninety-one billion. Deutsche Bank, three hundred and fifty-four billion. U uh, UBS, two hundred eighty-seven billion. Credit Suisse, two hundred sixty-two billion. Lehman Brothers, one hundred eighty-three billion. Lehman Brothers were one of them that there was a big stink about, and yet look at all of the ones up above it that you didn't hear much about them. Bank of Scotland, one hundred eighty-one billion. BNP Paribas, one hundred seventy-five billion. Wells Fargo, one hundred fifty-nine billion. Dexia, one hundred fifty-nine billion as well. Wachovia, one hundred forty-nine billion. Dresdner Bank, one hundred thirty-five billion. Societe Generale, one hundred and twenty-four billion, and all other borrowers, two point six three nine trillion. Okay, couple more. <laughs> then I got to go check out the pig. The fe uh, number thirty-three. The Federal Reserve also paid those big banks six hundred fifty-nine point four million in fees to help administer those secret loans. Is that hush money? And during the last financial crisis, big European banks were allowed to borrow an unlimited amount of money from the Federal Reserve at ultra-low interest rates. So finally, let's see, do we want to get to, yeah. Wow, I could just go on and on and on. This is just really depressing. It needs to go. It needs to go. You know, once I got past five, it was like redundant, redundant. Just douche it. Uh, yeah. What's that? Grim, you're a klutz. What the hey? So am I. Okay. Thank you, Katie Troxel. He put that over on uh, that effing site. And, uh, I need to save that. Yeah. Because I need to finish going through it myself. So. Um, I'm going to go check out the pig real quick. Because i got to find out what happened this date in history. I'm getting close to the end of my time. Holy shit. Holy shite. Okay, the word of the day over here on PIGazette.com is Queen. It's the most prominent figurehead of British royalty and part of a long line of privileged people who think the sun shines out of their butt cracks. Pretty much. In the quotable quotes section, 
The dumbing down of America accelerates thanks to a government cesspool scheme that produces idiots with self-esteem. The prick of the illiterate la uh, litter qualifies for advanced neo-Marxist indoctrination in an institution of alleged higher learning where any residual intellectual activity is exterminated with ruthless efficiency. Thank you, Hambo, for those brilliant words. Yes, that's why I call them the ivory towers of educraption. Because they feed you crap. This date in history, October the 12th, 1792, directionally challenged Italian Day. Columbus Day was first celebrated. Yeah. This date in history, the 12th of October, 1977. Holy, he never knew what hit him, Batman. Blind as a proverbial bat due to a blindfold, an alleged psychic named Romark dro uh, goes for a drive and slams into a cop car. Oops. <laughs> Oops. And finally, this date in history, the 12th of October, 1986, staging a stunning collapse that registered on every seismograph on Earth, California Angels are one strike from the World Series and blow it, letting the Red Sox win the pennant. Wow. Wow. That sucks to be that pitcher. So, that is what happened this date in history. Now, let me see if I can find something else. Because I know, I just kind of, it's a freaky Friday. What can I tell you? Um, okay, what is that? Oh, uh, do I want to go there? I'm checking out alternate news. Oh, no, that's an old one. That's an old one. I won't go there. Because we've had other, we've had other silliness since then. Um, do I want to go? Hmm. Here we go. We'll go with this one. This one is in uh, from Alternate News from their medicine category. It's from Medicine.News. Pre-fluorinated chemicals, or PFCs, found in nearly half of all fast food wrappers from McDonald's, Boyga King, Starbucks, and other food retailers. So, here we go. High cholesterol and rising blood sugar levels are not the only trade-offs that people are getting from eating their favorite fast food fixes. A new study has found that highly toxic chemicals are present in some of the wrappers used for fast food packaging. And these chemicals may contaminate the food and make their way into the bloodstream of the consumer. I would think, you know, if they're around something that is hot, they are going to get into the food. It's going to just kind of like an osmosis thing. So while it's, <clears throat> excuse me, while it's no secret that fast food items continue to bloat the American belly, pre, pre, blah, 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 why I have trouble with that, pre-fluorinated chemicals or PFCs found in fast food wrappers appear to further ex exacerbate the drastically declining health status of the general population. PFCs are the same chemicals used to line nonstick cookware, their flame retardants and stain resistant products. Great. Now, previous research revealed that PFCs found in such packaging may actually migrate into the food itself, which when consumed can accumulate in the body. And a recent study found modest amounts of PFCs in 56% of dessert and bread wrappers, 20% of paperboard products, such as those that hold french fries and other fried foods, and 38% of sandwich and burger wrappers. Researchers also found this compound in 57% of Tex-Mex food wrappers and 16% of beverage containers. In 2011, some food packaging manufacturers in the United States began voluntarily pulling the use of these PFCs from their products due to health concerns. 
and findings from one study published in the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology made it evident, however, that even though these harmful chemicals are being phased out by some manufacturers due to their potential health risks, other manufacturers are choosing to continue their use. Now this study reinforces the reality that these chemicals are highly persistent in the environment and may find their way into people's bodies for years after they no longer are no longer intentionally added. Now this study adds to concerns about chemicals that contaminate highly processed or packaged foods, potentially magnifying health effects above and beyond the effects that may result from their high fat or high sugar content. That is from Dr. Leonardo Trasande. Now the hazards of PFCs, there have been various clinical studies that have identified a strong correlation between PFCs and adverse health concerns. The PFCs found in fast food packaging, um, <coughs> excuse me, play a role <coughs> excuse me again, in the prevalence of obesity and diabetes. And a Canadian study in the journal Environmental Research revealed a correlation between PFC exposure and elevated cholesterol levels in adults. Now, another diabetes study revealed a significant correlation between high PFC exposure and impaired glucose homeostasis, as well as greater prevalence of the disease. Also, a study published in the International Journal of Epidemiology showed that children, especially boys with higher prenatal PFC exposure, were at risk of congenital cerebral palsy. Kid, people, 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 you're even doing it to your unborn kids or your kids that you haven't even done the fun stuff to because it's getting passed on. Holy carp. Now, I'm going to go ahead and share this one with you. It also goes on to say the PFCs and the environmental concerns. But there was also um, another article that I saw. Was that in my pocket? About parents dealing with ADHD. Um... Okay, I know I saw it somewhere, but God only knows where the hell it went. Hmm, hmm. Okay, maybe it's, nope. Huh, and maybe, just maybe, it's because this refreshed and now it's not there anymore. Damn it! Oh, well. Wow, I'm almost out of time. Um, Y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair, and yeah, I'm <laughs> squirrel tonight, so eh, as if that's anything unusual. But be sure to stick around, because later on this evening will be Grimner and Moose Girl with the Freaker's Ball, and that is always a good time had by all. Also, tomorrow at noon Eastern Time. Is it noon Eastern Time? I think uh, the Dork Table with Flash a Rooney Dork will be here on RealLibertyMedia.com, and then Sunday, starting at noon Eastern Time, will be Grimner who's going to be jumping on the radio to play some blues for you, and there will be a rousing game of trivia going on in the chat, which I rarely type fast enough to be able to get an answer in before either Speedy Gonzalez Grim or Moose Girl or Kate get it answered let alone if I have it right, or even spell it right. <laughs> oh, well, it's still fun to watch. And sometimes I watch and I knit, and then I try and answer, and it's like 20 seconds too late. But what the hell? It is fun. And Grimmy does play some pretty awesome blues. And then he leads you into Hal Anthony, who's going to open up a can of whoop-ass on yo ass Sunday here on the RLM. Then... Directly following Hal Anthony is a new show with Art Underground. Honey, what is, um, I forgot, I forgot, where's that at? 
Let me see. Did Flash Rooney post the name of it? Damn it. Art Underground will have his new show starting Sunday, directly following Hal Anthony here on the RL and M. Um, I will be back next week, Wednesday, for the Wackadoodle Wednesday edition of the Rocket Chair. I hope y'all don't freeze out this weekend. I know it's supposed to be a little on the... Well, tomorrow is supposed to be nice yet. So that's why when I get off work, hopefully I will get off around 3 o'clock. And then I can get home and get my potatoes dug before the rain hits. And yeah, so I will be <coughs> processing a lot of potatoes on Sunday. <laughs> Whee! But it'll be snowing outside, so it's all good. It's all good. Um, where is that? Darn it! I thought for sure. I thought for sure. Okay. There was. I'm going to have to find it for um, next week sometime. Cause um, it was something about parents. And uh, their children with ADHD and stepping away from the medication and being able to, quote unquote, cure their child of ADHD, which ADHD is a made up thing anyway. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We all have it at one time or another. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you, Grim. Straight Talk 101 with Art Underground. At 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you, Grimmy, for letting me know what that is. Okay. I suppose I need to get out of here because you know what? I got some ham steaks to cook up and some pancake batter to make and some some farm fresh eggs. <laughs> and I'm feeling just a wee bit on the hangry side. Good thing you guys can't hear my stomach growling over rascals purring. Oh, well. Y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening and a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And please remember, I truly do love you all. And I wish you all enough. Good night.